our first keynote um, is themed Rights by Design and Default in Hybrid Architectures by uh, Thomas Posty, the Chancellor of Justice at the Government of Finland. Rights by Design uh, and Default is a demanding uh, but necessary objective for the future of public administration. Our next keynote is about hybrid architectures and systems where humans live and work together with intelligent systems. How could such solutions provide possibilities to the human-centric public administration and service? And what kind of design and maintenance is needed in practice? And what legal changes are necessary to regulate human relationships and interface with intelligent machines and the networks? Dr. Thomas Posty is the Chancellor of Justice of the Government of Finland, the, uh, the Supreme Guardian of Law in Finland. He's worked for more than 25 years with the intersection of law and digital technologies, both as a practitioner and uh, academic researcher, and he has an active portfolio uh, in research and practice. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Posty. Dr. Pusty, why are these such exciting times to be working um, in the intersection of law and, and digital technologies? These are exciting times because this is already the fifth wave, for example, for the AI, and there have been so many AI winters, so the bit disappointment, slowness. And this time, I have the feeling that this time we are going to make it. We are going to make a huge step forward in, 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 in the way in which we can deploy digitalization in the various sectors. And the law is there to support, and this is simply great to rewrite the general principles for a better future. I actually get goosebumps when you say that. We can be part of this. It's yes. now going to happen. Yes. And you're going to tell us how, how that can be done in a safe and human-centered way. Yes, I tried to, but this is something we, we really require, this kind of, not only cooperation, we do not only need cooperation, we really need to work together to make it happen. There are many questions and problems we still do not know and we have to solve, but mm -hmm. they are solvable. Thank you so much. And I know a lot of people are work looking forward to this keynote, so I'll leave it to you. And again, questions, uh, get the QR code for the people here and um, then for those of you online, please use the question window and I will, um, I will follow that and, and bring the questions back to Dr. Pesty. Floor is yours. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and I, I will go through a practitioner from academics reflection of a potential way to see how we could uh, push this digital administration with a human face further. So these are reflections. There are many unknown answers and many of the answers we have to do together. This presentation is about the law, but it's also very much about the responsible AI and relation to the AI ethics as well. The, the artificial intelligence ethical discourses and the AI ethics questions in many, many ways intersect with fundamental legal questions as well. If we look at the, where we are today, we have been hearing many things, but a little bit of kind of statistical background, and we in Scandinavia, we shall not deceive ourselves to kind of a undue proudness, but there are some things we have been pretty successful. There is a rather recent uh, statistical survey which are fairly reliable, the European Union Digital Economy and Digital Society Index DESI, where Finland was ranking the best, the Denmark was among the top leaders, uh, Sweden as well, of course Norway. All the Nordic countries are doing well, and this United Nations e-government survey, which is also trying to include this kind of human aspect there, the Scandinavia was really like counted as a top, top reference into it. So the question now is that uh, we seem to have uh, an administrative tradition which has been highly performant, but how we are in fact uh, maintaining these characters 
while on the same time taking the use of the technology and responding to the to the issues which are related to the to the technology. This UNE survey also also set some ambitious goals for the for the future of the digital government. They are speaking about agile government, who is really also not agile in a technical or consultant language way, but also in a way that it's really able to learn. This kind of learning capacity and this kind of intelligence f uh, features, and not only in a technical sense, but in a, in a higher problem-solving capacity. And, uh, and at the same time being able to respond to the citizens and corporations' need for, for services, and need for security, and need for for solving support. And I think that the artificial intelligence is, is going to be a great tool over there, but there are still some ways we have to reflect also in the way in which how we are doing it, not only about to which domain we can apply it, but how we are doing it. In Finland, we are currently reflecting how we could solve some of the challenges related that there is a rather ambitious but still modest. You can be ambitious and modest at the same time. Legislative, a legislative initiative of creating a general legal framework for use of automatic decision making in the whole of pa public sector. The Parliament of Finland is uh, supposed to approve this legislative package this, uh, this autumn. On the same time, also some very old constitutional institutions do change. For example, my own, the Chancellor of Justice of Finland, is pretty medieval of its origin, but uh, there is already a new law which has entered into force on the 1st of October, which has assigned uh, oversight of the development and use and the maintenance of automatic systems in the public sector to our oversight. So. So we are one of the first specific AI authorities globally to, to my collection. We are talking here about the future and, uh, and uh, an understanding of the future is that the humans will increasingly work together with the machines who are intelligent, not necessarily intelligent in the way in which humans are, but uh, capable of some autonomic uh, problem solving up in addition to repetitive tasks. So, so this kind of human and uh, machine intelligence co-work is also at the center of the future of the digital government and digital public administration. And this brings us down to some old questions on the computer science and, uh, for example, the themes of uh, human-computer interaction, human-computer confluence become important. These uh, traditions and these approaches in the computer system development and design have been trying to put the use, the use of the systems at centre and also cared for some important societal goals like uh, inclusion and particip participation. But this, this HCII tradition has also something more profound to tell if that's combined with the general development of the, of the AI solutions and how they are deployed, because now we not only have this kind of interaction with interfaces, but we have a wider issue of how we are living and working together successfully with, with machines and machine-based systems, which are not static. They are also developing over the time, so kind of technical limi limitations of today are not necessarily those ones of, of tomorrow. And this is a two-way influence, in fact. The computer systems will also have a significant impact in the ways in which humans are acting in these uh, surroundings. So, so this is a very much a kind of interaction, not only like how we humans are steering it. And uh, there are Classical examples, for example, this uh, yesterday's problems of this robot in a crowd problem, and there, uh, and there also in the crowd, the, the challenge is that the human is not necessarily fully rational and expectable, but can be rather uh, erratic. We have also seen this kind of things in this oversight practice so far in, in, in my own supervisory field. We recently made an 
decision concerning automatic decision making in the Finnish government concerning social benefits. Where there was a student who simply wanted to use this public sector platform to distribute his CV, but not to apply for unemployment support. And, but however, the whole design of this information system and this automatic decision making automatically assumed that everybody who is connecting is searching for social benefits. So therefore, this machine erroneously issued a negative decision cause bad mood for this uh, client who simply wanted to distribute effectively his CV. So, so we have also this kind of hidden or, or rather innocent assumptions in the behind this kind of systemic solutions and once they are moved into AI uh, context and automatic decision making uh, context, this kind of mistakes, uh, these kind of faulty assumptions create, they multiply. So, so therefore, it's also very important to have a broad view enough on this kind of assumption on to, to which we are basing, basing the solutions. This also comes down to the role of the law. So the law has so far been regulating like human to human relations or this kind of so-called legal relations where where the question is of, of a company as a legal person in relation to, to another company or to, to a client. But my argument is that there is an emerging new role for law in human-computer interaction with the intelligence system and that the law will increasingly regulate human-computer interaction. And that's what we are also seeing in, for example, my own institution's uh, case laws where increasingly kind of requirements on that interaction are derived from the old principles of the administrative law, like the service principle requiring uh, require not only advice, but uh, the fact that this user's real needs are taken into consideration and the users are not uh, created like a as one group, because, for example, in the hospital systems, uh, uh, they're, the, they're creating physician and the patient, they are two different groups with a very different needs in some specific aspects. So this is also very much an area into which law is uh, coming into. If we have a look on this, what is happening in the digital, uh, digital government, so, so the aim is and should be a cognitive government who is able to use data and not only use data in a mechanical way, but to, to derive kind of a better cognition and uh, better policies and be also adaptive to rather rapidly changing needs. This may sound rather self-evident, but it's not so easy in practice. And that requires, and this is an old topic in the Nordic uh, law and informatics literature, uh, that uh, this requires a look beyond this kind of technical solutions alone. And we have to look also on the organizational solutions procedures. Specifically concerning the AI and automatic decision making and automatic, automated decision support, we can distinguish between uh, the decision making itself, organization of the uh, administration, use of this kind of wide uh, whole of government or even society-wide platforms is an advantage compared to kind of single authority organization. Automatic decision support is different than uh, direct decision making. And then we have this communication and advice of the clients, which is not necessarily leading directly to the decision, but that's automatic. The simple example is a chatbot, but we can go much beyond that. And then there is all, all these things which are creating the cognitive capacities for the government behind this information processing, analytics, dissemination of, of information. And this, for a lawyer, this is uh, interesting and distinguished because uh, even though the general principles are the same, so then the, the practical legal requirements are a bit different in each of these areas. And also for the effectiveness point of view, so all of these various aspects need to be considered also separately. What does it mean to design? So it means that there is a design of platforms, network organization systems, which which go beyond of the individual uh, applications and we should see also very much on the context and how in which it's done and this is also called for work on this uh, both the enterprise information system architecture at the same time bearing in mind that we also have at least in Finland we have also the 
the experience that we tried in the public sector to have a whole of government-wide enterprise architecture modeling, and that would uh, uh, prove to be a little bit too rigid way of work uh, to realize it, so certain flexibility is, is needed, but still we need to have a look on this entirety of the thing. About the AI in in particular, so on, in the legal discussion there are plenty of talk about it, but there, is, there seems to be also that there is either uh, too much optimism that it is going to solve many of the things which are not necessarily solved alone by the technology, but there are also fears, and so we should be cautious that we are not projecting our fears about the unknowns to, to, the, to the use of the technology. But what it is, it is a tool, it's a very powerful tool, but this is nothing new in the history. The humans have always learned to work with tools. That's with fire, that's with different kind of devices, um, etc. And uh, this, this happened with the electricity. So, so this, is a, this is a tool and we have experience in the human history of learning to use tools, but it's a learning process. Important there is that's, that it gives the possibility to augment human problem solving power and capabilities. And uh, as we are doing it, we the humans will live and work together with the robots. In fact, this is also on these clinical things, even though it's a physician who is doing the thing, but he is increasingly working with this kind of, a, uh, this kind of decision support, uh, support tools. And so this is this partnership, which is at the, also the foundation of the architecture building. And the, the problem simply is how we can augment this uh, problem-solving capacity in terms of uh, impacts. And also when we think about the impacts of what are the values and the legal rights in, in that. And what we need is that the system-level approach that we also think about these values and also the impacts in terms of rights at, at the level. For example, these kind of architecture choices and system-level choices may have an impact into that and we, we take them into consideration. We should also be cautious about this argument human in the loop or under human control, which is very much emphasized recently in the AI ethics, because as we know, the human is not necessarily bringing any good into there. It, it can bring a lot of good, but it can also bring uh, this kind of erratic element into the system. So, so we also need a better understanding also on this kind of how human brains are functioning in, in the interaction with this kind of intelligence system and how a human in this interaction can be also a source of problems. In this accident investigations and this the technical discipline investigating that we have a rather good, in fact, background on that with, uh, with this kind of analogic systems, but with, with the AI we need to step into the next level into that, and this is something which is also calling for new, new research in the, in, the, in the area, and that's uh, incredibly important and also seen in the practice, for example, how some mistakes have been happening to the systems, that the systems are not, for example, configured for example, at some of the systems in the Finnish hospitals, in the ways in which uh, uh, physicians are really working, and this can be also a uh, source of the problem, even though the tools are good as such. So the hybrid intelligence I'm sp uh, speaking in favor of is it is a combined intelligence and problem solving capability of the, of the humans and the machines together and, uh, and thinking that to which areas the humans are the best and where you have to have humans in the loop and where you can rely on the machines and how this interaction is, is going, going on. So, so very very simple, but this also means that on the development process we have to have uh, ethical rules and legal rules which concern the process, but we also the, the impact and outcomes of the solutions, but also the, the professions who are working with the sol solutions. And all this will be subject for, subject for legal regulation as well, and also where ethical issues are intersecting with, with the law. We do need, in fact, also the common language between the computer science system designers, algorithm designers and lawyers. And uh, one of the things we have been engaged in Finland in, 
in an international collaboration is now the reflection on whether uh, we don't have the answers yet, whether we would need, in fact, to complement this kind of a design pattern collections and workflow uh, portfolios, which are rather common tools for, uh, for computer system developers, that they should be looked together with the lawyers so that we would have some legal design pat patterns for digital government and also, also for, the, uh, for the privacy. And the similar thing also for the training of the data, because even though the system would be perfect, so if the, if the training is done not uh, systematically and taking the context of the context, so, so then these things can go wrong and this kind of particularly machine learning systems and also other systems and also require constant control that they keep on track as we want to. So, so these rights and ethics are there in the various stages and, uh, and the issue is simply that uh, this kind of also legal implications have to be taken into consideration at each stage of this work, uh, work process too and in the various aspects uh, in, in the design and uh, and maintenance of the of these systems and and there we also need this kind of a commonly accurate uh, complementary methods to to law alone but the law can be helpful there and uh, and it's uh, it's the foundations for this and the ethics will will complement it and on the other hand good ethical codes can be a foundation for the for the legal approaches uh, particularly in the areas where there is not yet written law about it the this hybrid architecture, hybrid intelligence, in fact, uh, mean from the purely legal perspective that uh, the law should be written and drafted on the perspective that they can also support this kind of automation and hybrid problem solving capabilities and should indicate also the areas, not in terms of technical solutions, but create, for example, typical cases uh, as a kind of use cases uh, which can be easily decided by the machines and uh, also those areas which require wide discretion which in which we are not yet fully there and we, where this decision support can be helpful but uh, it's not to be solved by the machine so that we, uh, we designate those areas ra uh, rather clearly and uh, how in fact this human shall be in the loop for example creating an administrative review proce uh, procedure. That's the way in which uh, the new legislation Finland is trying to approach it, but this is only a very, very modest beginning into it. To conclude, so, so my argument can be summarized as a twofold. Hybrid intelligence and responsible artificial intelligence by rights and design is the future of the digital government. And secondly, we are not yet there. This is an interdisciplinary journey which we have to take together, lawyers, computer scientists, data scientists, ethicists. And this is going to be a great journey for the benefit for the humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Posty. We have questions um, from our audience. Our first one is uh, on ways of working. How do you build the teams in government necessary to do this kind of interdisciplinary work? Well, it depends on which stage you are. This kind of research collaborations for the applicational research and also for the basic research, that's uh, important to, to arrive at very new thing. And there are various instruments on which are partly national how we can do this kind of working co-creation together with uh, with with the researchers and uh, and and companies then there are this kind of inter innovative public procurement which is also important that you uh, create the criteria and also you are not necessarily only uh, procuring solutions but you can also procure work for and uh, share a little bit on the risk and then on the on the time of when the administration is there it's important to have also the sufficient uh, capacity inside the government to be able to, to continue this co-creation. Co so you can't really fully outsource it. So. so what would a dream team look like? A dream team would look like that there, is, uh, there are lawyers, there are these experts in the domain, if it's a clinical environment, there's uh, doctors, nurses. There shall be a wide selection of the final users, user panels, clients, citizens. And 
then there, there need to be, of course, various technical, technical folk, both on this software side and then on this data training and data, data science side, and then, then lawyers. So four different groups that normally don't work together. Can you, do we see uh, good examples in Finland, for example, of um, cross-functional teams working like this? Uh, not sufficiently, not sufficient, but in some areas we do. We have, uh, for example, managed to create a, managed to create a national platform for patient data. We have uh, uh, running this kind of citizen services based on AI, where in fact the Finnish uh, uh, doctors, this code of practice, uh, Duodecim code of practice has been the foundation of the, of the AI, and this is developed in a, in a, in a governmental process involving all the, all the stakeholders, including also the, also the users. By the way, students are quite often this kind of user panel yeah. uh, test, uh, test dummies, and, and that's, uh, that's operational. That was of great help, for example, during the COVID pandemic. So, so we do see there. And we, if we would meet here in, say, three years, would there be other areas uh, in the public sector besides healthcare that you think will also be working in new and more more I collaborative think, ways? I, th I think if I would get an invitation to, in four years, to digitalize Stockholm, I would be able to tell you what is the practical experience of the of the new uh, employment administration of Finland, which is platform and this kind of automation base, and I would be able to tell you this automation of the Finnish immigration administration. That's a huge, um, a huge effort that you you're working on in Finland. Yeah, we are rather rather ambitious. We try to do it cross sectorially across the across the government and then go further. Um, this is a question about um, good examples. Can you please give us an example of your best e-gov service and maybe an example of a failure? As I'm reading this, it could be anywhere in the world. I'm sure you scan um, global initiatives. Yeah, the. The, the good old initiative is how this Finnish tax administration has been doing, but that's uh, rule-based automation. So there is 16 million administrative decisions of a year, and last year 14.5 were decided automatically wow. by, by the machines alone. And we have a real decent uh, customer satisfaction. But I would say that this is in the healthcare, both as the diagnosis support and then this own health where the citizens themselves can log in and get either, for example, mental health advice or this kind of pre-diagnosis whether to contact. So because that's running on a rather advanced AI, which is... Uh, is uh, growing pretty well. But inside there has been also some of the failures we have pinpointed. And the failure has been, for example, that the in this kind of platform. So when you connect the citizens, not always using with whom you are interacting with, whether it's a robot, which uh, region service. Is that important for the individual? Yes, it is. Yes, it mm -hmm. is. Because uh, the assess that what is actually happening so that you're somehow not lost in the kind of virtual rea reality. So, so this information parts have been somewhat a failure. And then, we do have also some of the information systems which are yet there and have been horribly expensive. For example, this uh, arms registration, if you're an arms on. In Finland, there are a lot of hunters, so that's important. So that has been delayed, delayed, delayed. And the thing is that if you start this kind of design of a system, wrongly and you use the other software which is existing and try to simply like a little bit modified for other purposes so then you are having a new software with all the problems of the of the legacy systems um this is a question about um uh, legality do we need separate ai laws or laws integrated to existing laws governing sector and industry where ai is being used or a, a third possibility could be instead law having rights based approach having a rights based approach first as in human rights i think they are all of those are possible it's striking that there is a bill of digital rights on related to ai ethics the similar work in the u.s government which is ethics compared to the european commission high level expert group it's uh, it's called bill of ai rights in the in the u.s so that's this kind of rights base because rights have a very strong appealing but i would think that in the european context we will have this we will we will certainly have this european union 
AI Act, and the Council of Europe is working with a binding legal instrument on the AI as such. So then I would be rather cautious to have separate AI Acts in the, in the national level in a country like Sweden and Finland. In Finland we decided, and I think it was the right approach, that we will not have a separate AI Act, but we rather integrate this AI and this automation into Administrative Procedure Act and this all these uh, existing acts of public administration. Like the a normal backbone, like yeah. a normal... Mm, yeah, like okay. a normal backbone, mm -hmm. because it's a tool. It's one of the tools. We have other tools as well. We don't have, unfortunately, time for more questions. I know Dr. Pasty loves feedback. Hand up if this session was valuable to you. Yes, yeah, see, so worthwhile um, coming here. Thank you so much for taking your time, Dr. Pasty. Yep. Thank you.